Welcome everybody, thank you for being here. This is Rafa and you're watching Mystic Times. Today I have the great pleasure and the great honor of having my friend Eric Arneson back. He's uh, a fantastic tarot reader and a very funny and, and um, happy energy guy. Uh, it's very nice to, to reconnect with you after our, our last episode. I think it was like about a year ago or so. Um, oh yeah. And and it was it was a very nice uh, very nice time that we that we spent together. I remember we laughed a lot, and I I have a very fond memory of of that day. Um, we we looked a little bit at, at tarot last time, and I hope that today, well, we we've planned to to watch, not to watch, but to to read uh, some 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 energies that are currently perhaps floating around us, and to see what the next year of 2022 has in store for us. Um, so yeah, um, just how are you, Eric? And uh, welcome back. I am doing good, you know. Uh, I guess I do want to say like one thing that really makes me happy is when winter starts coming around and it gets all gray and gloomy and rainy and it's uh, it's beautiful Portland weather right now. It is, the sky is overcast. I cannot see the sun. Uh, I know it looks well lit. I, my, my desk is like right up facing the window and stuff. So I'm looking straight out onto a gray sky. It's delightful. <laughs> Amazing. And I like the, when the summer comes. So I'm happy we can both be in the, in the weather that we most like. That means, uh, that means we're both in our happy place at yeah. the same time of year. And we're both in our miserable place at the same time of year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, um, as I was saying, it's that time of year uh, where we want predictions and we want um, at least some guidance from the from the invisible world and from the world of of the goddess today i i was listening to to some some podcasts that were talking a little bit about the idea of the goddess and i i got some some more clarity about how how we can reconnect and 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 how important it is to to have these these moments of opening up to these invisible energies, to this um, language of, of nature that is always here present for us, uh, but it's uh, with our society has um, strayed a little bit towards the male side and it's all like very rational and, and language and alphabets, um, but, but that we seem to have forgotten how to listen to, to that ever present energy that is uh, that is the goddess, and uh, I think we we can tap into that a little bit today. Yeah, I mean, I don't even know if it's something that we've forgotten how to do, or if it's something that we've never really been good at. You yeah, know, I, think, think? I think that might be kind of like the ever-present eternal struggle of like humanity, right? Like we're always trying to learn how to listen better. Mm. We just have never gotten there. I think, I don't know, it's hard to say, you know, I mean, we weren't really around back in the old, old, old days, so who knows what it was like. Mm. I like the the idea of, of uh, I, th I think it's kind of like a Garden of Eden uh, sort of concept, that idea of, of those very, very ancient civilizations where humanity was or had reached uh, a particular kind of balance between the, the male and female, and female energies, and mm -hmm. that unfortunately for some reason or there is something else that needed to be learned that thing works in in cycles apparently and we forgot we've uh, kind of fallen from that grace and and uh straight as i was saying too much to the to the logic and rational side of of our experience and of our being but i think it's been all for some reason i mean i don't think the the world would allow us the world. I mean, uh, the planet and the goddess, the goddess itself, Gaia. I don't think she would allow. I think Terence McKenna talked about this. That um, there is some reason that 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 the planet hasn't gotten rid of us yet, uh, because if it wanted to, it, it definitely could. I think um, so. It's like it's placed all its bets on on humanity for some kind of evolution or transcendence to a, a next level. Uh, and I think we are we are well on our way, but. It's gonna. It seems it's gonna be a bumpy ride. Yeah, I think uh, I, I I understand what you're saying about sort of like the the allure. You know, the the sort of like there, there's a kind of romance to that idea that we've fallen from grace and that we're trying to get back there. And I think that that 
there's a reason that that shows up in like every single system of of mysticism right like every single mystical teacher has that kind of like thing that sort of idea that we have fallen from grace but i also kind of i mean i guess i i guess i try to take a more optimistic approach to mysticism where i sort of look at it as we are conscious and sentient and have the ability to have these experiences and have this seeking because you know we're not really separate from the universe we're a part of the universe and one of the one of our purposes in being here and being able to observe is um you know, we're kind of the universe being uh, introspective, the universe looking in at itself, I guess. So I think that maybe the, I guess I sort of figure that that whole return to grace will be the point when we have um, finished, we finished looking inward, you know, we finished sort of examining what we're supposed to do here and it'll be done. I don't, I don't know. I'm not sure if that makes any sense. Does that make any sense? It does make sense. It also raises the question if there will actually be some kind of like end point or, or, or more like, mm -hmm. I remember one of the first times I played, it was the, the Pokemon game and uh -huh. the Game Boy, etc. And I remember like, once you finished it, there was still stuff that you could continue doing. You like completed the, the main mission of the game and the main story, but still you had hundreds of, of creatures to catch and other other uh, new subplots to discover after you finish the game. So I, I guess there could be something like that. Oh, it makes Pokemon so depressing, you know, since their, their tagline is gotta catch them all. <laughs> and like, even when you do catch them all, you're not done. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think you know that's a good question. I it uh, I was it was just making me think of. Uh, did you ever watch the TV show Babylon Five? No, I know the name. I think it's from uh, like of space. It's in about space. Yeah, it's a it's a science fiction TV show. Uh, but there's a theme in there that uh, you know humanity and like the other aliens that humanity is interacting with. You know, there's it, it's a it's like space politics. You know, mm -hmm. so there's like all these other aliens, but the whole set of aliens that are around right now aren't the first set of sentient aliens that there were these ones that came before who are like you know evolved into energy beings and all this kind of stuff like there's the you know it's still it's still a, i don't know there's there's kind of a mysticism to it but there's also kind of a you know almost a sciencey but it's it i guess I guess I was thinking of it, but I don't know if it's totally relevant because I guess in Babylon 5, there's still a like science will save us in the end sort of thing, <laughs> which I'm not sure is true. Mm, yeah, and also how how we define things. Maybe maybe at some point we'll see how, or, or not even maybe, I'm pretty sure this is gonna happen. We'll see science and spirituality connect. So science and mysticism, chemistry and alchemy, whatever. We'll see those, those apparent opposites uh, reconnect and, and become complementary to each other and perhaps the way towards that that um, that reason for the universe or, or for our existence uh, perhaps it's got to be somewhere in, in the middle or or using part of each I love that idea I I, I think that you're really onto something because I think that you know uh, it feels a lot like science has kind of lost its soul you know yeah. when when it when it turned to the ultra materialistic and started being like you know we aren't going to believe in anything spiritual or mystical unless there is proof that follows the scientific method you know we it's it's sort of like it's sort of like science trying to explain something that exists outside of its purview yeah. you know we yeah i think we we probably talked about this before how you know, I guess I kind of use this view of like the the material world, the universe we live in being sort of a uh, almost like an emergent property of consciousness. You know, our interactions with the material world is our attempt to kind of like look inward and and see. But uh, but it's not the true reality. It's the reality splashed on the cave wall, you know, Plato's yeah. cave wall and trying to explain things that aren't in that reality using the methods of that reality uh they can't necessarily work you know it's like in pokemon 
you might have the goal of got to catch them all in Pokemon, but that's a, that's another, you know, that's a sub reality. It's a sub reality that you're immersed in. And when you come back into the external reality, uh, luckily you're not going to run into a mouse that shoots lightning bolts, for instance, that would be terrifying, but, uh, but you know, you're not going to catch them all in the world. It's, that's just not how it works out here. Mm, yeah. And I've, I've come to this, to this thought of, of like we are um, so in, in in regards to what you were just saying that the material world or this universe we're inhabiting you know the gnostics have this this view of or, or some gnostics can kind of see it kind of like a prison other people might see it like a school etc and what i what i've come to to see is that the material world the outside world is in some way that is that that is beyond the rational logic. It's, and at the same time, it is within that logic, but the outside world is the inside of our mind projected outward, you know? And if we were to think of the process by which we are aware of our surroundings, it's nothing but that, right? So it's like mm -hmm. our mind puts a filter over something that apparently is out there and, and then projects it back uh, so that we can like move around, but it's not exactly what we're seeing. Some people might see the same thing very differently, but so in, in that, in that looking at the thing in that way, I've come to, to even think how, when you go outside where, what we're, uh, what we're describing as outer space, we're actually going deeper and deeper into our mind to the point of even our subconscious mind is out there projected, right? So our conscious mind would be what's projected most close to our attention and our subconscious mind would be farther away in distance, in kilometers, whatever. And uh -huh. the subconscious would be placed materially out there, very far away, together with the collective unconscious, with the archetypes, et cetera, et cetera. It's all over there and it's being projected inward but at the same time it's being projected outward but because they are like a loop of the same thing and that's why the planets in astrology can have that that effect on us and that's perhaps in some way or surely for me connected to why we can read uh, those energies by using the tarot mm -hmm. that is Ooh. <laughs> that is a uh that's a little bit of a mind bender. I have to think about that one. I don't know how to do. I, yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess I hadn't really tried to go through the. Um, I guess I've never really tried to imagine how the subconscious and collective unconscious and all that sort of stuff would would be present in uh, the physical universe. You know, I guess I I try to usually. Yeah, I, I try to sort of, I guess what I try to do, oh, and this is something that I've not figured out at all, but I, what I try to do is I try to remember that like our concepts of space and time are also really strongly tied to the physical universe, right? Like they are, they are basically like the defining blocks. You know, you've got space, you've got time, you've got matter, you've got energy. And these are sort of like fundamental parts of the physical universe but do they exist outside of the physical universe or is it just all part of the picture show that we're experiencing? So yeah, I guess I hadn't really considered what it would look like or how you would place those sorts of things. But I, but I do think that there's something really interesting there because of the way it, uh, it places the mind outside of the confines of the body, mm. right? It sort of does acknowledge kind of like a um, universality that. or a largeness of mind. I like that. Mm, yeah. Just think about it for a moment. Look at, at the, the background <laughs> behind you, right? You, yeah. All those books are currently, uh -huh. uh, that you've read are currently inhabiting your mind. And at the same time, they are right there. So in a way, it's, it's very, very, very true. Um, I don't know, it's, a, it's an idea I've been working with, and I think it, it's interesting that how it, how it joins matter and, and energy and, and the, the, the observer, you know, it, it's, I don't know. So um, in, in that context, I think we could, we could transition maybe 
to look mm-hmm. at, at uh, what's, what's going on and what we can expect for next year, which I think is, is like the, the, the something that is really important uh, right now. Um, since we are all, everybody that's watching this is definitely aware of at least a relative um, connection between the, 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 the yeah. invisible and the visible worlds. And well, through, through Taro, we're going to, to look into that. Yeah, I want to, I have a question for you now. So, you know, we live in very different parts of the world. We're probably like 3,000 miles away from each other, 4,000 miles, 6,000, I don't know, but a, a lot, a lot of miles and even more kilometers, like 9,000 kilometers away from each other, who knows? Um, but it, it kind of makes me think like currently, you know, like with the global pandemic happening, we have, we have more, it, it, it's sort of like a worldwide uh, crisis that I think maybe like ties people together a little bit more than we usually have, right? So as we come into the new year, everybody has sort of that source of anxiety and worry, which might make the future feel more uncertain for everybody on the planet than it usually does, you know? Like, I think a lot of times you'll have, you know, parts of the world are doing well and parts of the world aren't doing well. So the level of anxiety going into a new year might not always be the same. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, totally. I did not put that in the form of a question, but I was just thinking, like, does that <laughs> feel <laughs> does that feel accurate to you? <laughs> yeah, I, I totally agree that we're all sharing a kind of frequency or a kind of emotional landscape or background that is very, very similar to all of us, in spite of our personal, uh, individual situations or problems or or accomplishments or, or any happiness that anybody might be going through, there is this, this worldwide uncertainty and, and worry and fear. I mean, even ranging from people who might not see any, any conspiracies or any foul play behind what's going on, even between the normies, right? Uh, mm-hmm. there, there is anxiety, fear, there is lots of people waking up thanks to to all the the instability that there is in the world so it's a very um a very like transitional period you know um Mm -hmm. what's this thing that you you put on on the door so that it spins uh, on the on the axis you put the in spanish it's bisagras i don't remember the name in english it's it's one one of that kinds of moments that we're going through, or like the, the changing of eras, or something something of the sort, a sort mm. of beginning of a new cycle of some kind. Yeah, a uh, like a turnstile or a or a yeah. revolving door or yeah, something. The hinge. Yeah. Is what I was thinking. The hinge. Yeah. Wait, what's the Spanish word for hinge? Bisagra. <laughs> Bisagra. Okay, well, I've learned a Spanish word today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, so I think, okay, so like if we're going to be t- talking about, uh, if we're going to be looking at the tarot about this, I think that it's also, I think it's important to kind of acknowledge that when we do like really large scale readings like this, where it's sort of like, what can the entire planet expect? Mm-hmm. I don't know that the tarot always does the best job at that, but we can see, let's see what it tells us and we can talk about it while we're doing it. Yeah. Um, but we do want some kind of, we do want to like see what the question is we're going to ask. Like, what do you think we should, what, what's the question that you had in mind? I think yeah. you wrote something down. Yeah, so what I wrote down is, what can we expect and how do we best be ready to show up and make the most of 2022? (laughs) I think that's a good question. It's really open-ended, right? So there's the what you can expect thing. uh, And then uh, how can we make the most of it? How can we show up and make the most of it? I like that a lot. I think think we can go with that. It's vague enough that it gives the tarot Mm. chance to kind of like move around and display some stuff. any any yeah, kind of, of um, modification that you feel we, we could remove something or be a little bit more more specific to um, aspect? Just go ahead and suggest. Hmm. 
I think it'll work. I think it'll work with the reading with the with the the spread that I really like to use too, because I think it gives us uh yeah, I think it's gonna work really well. I'm I'm good with it. I know that when we when we were talking a little bit before we started, I was like, we might have to change this question, but I'm I think it'll work pretty well. Uh so now we have to just figure out what kind of deck we want to use. Cool. Because I've I've got a bunch of them here. Let me let me pull them out. I'll have to yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> for, me, for me personally, I, I after we spoke, you know, uh, on that date, I remember I showed you kind of the the smallest uh, deck of cards in the world, a very a very tiny one. Oh, yeah. uh, and I even uh, unboxed one one of the. It's called the the Spanish deck of cards, which is used uh, very common to play this game called Truco, which is some similar to Tarot in in a kind of way. Um, and I opened one of those. But then with, with time, after we spoke, uh, I bought myself the, the Rider weight. Uh -huh. I also bought the Marseille deck, which I, I'm nice. not, not so much of a fan. I, I really like the, the archetypes, the way they are, they are shown here mm -hmm. in the Rider weight. But the Marseille deck has, has more of, a, of the, the feel of the, of the Spanish deck. It does, yeah. Really cool. Yeah, I think uh, one of the things we talked about is like, uh, you know, in the in the English speaking world, the Rider weight deck is very, very common. And it's kind of the deck that um, most people start off with. Mm -hmm. So I do, I have my Rider weight deck. This is cool. my oldest, well, I don't know if it's my oldest, but it's definitely my most weathered tarot deck. I've used that one a lot. Cool. Uh, I have the Sacred Rose tarot also. Uh, sorry, these aren't in their original boxes. I can I can kind of show them a little bit here. So this one is, um, I like this one a lot because it has this sort of like 70s art style. Ooh. It looks like some sort of like 70s hippie art, but it's uh, it's pretty good. I've used this a lot for readings for other people and uh, folks seem to um, resonate with the artwork a lot. That one made me think of, of this band, Earth, Wind and Fire, kind of the art. In the oh, world. yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I also have my newest tarot deck, which is the Moonlit Hermit Tarot that was created by my friend Jay Swafford. Uh, I don't know if you've seen pictures of this on my Instagram, but it is, it is, uh, you know, Jay is a, um, is a uh, ceremonial magician and he's the artist who made the Picatrix deck. And these cards are, uh, are, they're, they're kind of Marseille style, but they're, they're this crazy, uh, inspired very strange uh collage art uh a little darker than um you're used to for tarot for sure there's a lot of skeletons <laughs> but it's a beautiful deck i really really yeah. like this one so lovely lovely images and i think i've only i've only done a couple of readings with it too so i'm i'm still pretty pretty new with this particular deck mm -hmm. um I also have another one of my favorites, uh, the Dark Exact Tarot, which was also made by a Portland artist. Uh, this one is, uh, has like very stark black and white imagery um, and zero people. There are no humans in it, but it does have these cool. Oh, I just flipped right to one of the cards I wanted to talk about. The, uh, it has two fool cards, an alpha fool and an omega fool. Uh, but aside from that, like it's uh, it's got kind of like the pip style. Uh, I really like this deck, but it, it's it's a uh, it doesn't have as much um, exciting artwork on the minor arcana, so that maybe won't be. It open. looks like a more advanced kind of deck. I like the right weight because of it's got like so much detail in each card that it, it uh -huh. like really I feel it really good for me. Like when I'm learning and still learning, kind of the early stages and. And it gives my mind like a lot of symbols to pick up on and to decode, and and I, I like learning with it. I think the the Marseille deck feels like a little bit more uh, more challenging or or a little bit colder for me still. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, for me the Marseille deck is a, it, one of the things that's really tricky about it is uh, it's a different you know school of tarot or a different style of tarot, so you have to learn different meanings, and that can be kind of tricky uh oh yeah i do have one more my the last tarot deck i had with me is the the fifth spirit tarot which is a um like a, a queer inclusive deck so it's uh it's all like um 
you know, kind of genderless characters, lots of people of different nationalities and mm -hmm. uh, races and stuff, lots of cool artwork. This is also by a Portland artist. I guess I really like tarot decks by Portland artists. Um, hold on, let me see if I can find. Oh yeah, here's uh, a <clears throat> the King of Cups is um, Mr. Rogers. I don't know if you had Mr. Rogers in the. No, but I, I know about him. Yeah. <laughs> oh, good, good. I'm glad that you know about him because he is probably uh, the the uh, nicest American we've ever created. <laughs> <laughs> nicest uh, fiction. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Lovely. Although supposedly he was really nice in real life too. I don't know. Yeah, so cool. we, <laughs> we could hope. Uh, so what, which one of those looks good? Do you want to just go classic and stick with the right um, away? Whichever one you choose is okay for me. One well, that's a lot of pressure. You want, <laughs> if you wanted to choose, I, I have a favorite. I think now the second one, I think, was the, 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 the 70s art style. Okay, let's do it. The Sacred right, Rose. Right. Okay, that'll be good. You'll you'll like it. It has enough stuff in it that's writer weight like that. I think you'll still be comfortable with it, or you'll still be able to see stuff that you're you're familiar with. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. But the artwork is cool. So okay. tell us also about the 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 style of of uh, the, the kind of spread that you you say you like. <laughs> okay. Yeah, uh, this spread is, uh, I use it on almost all of my readings. Um, I call, oh, I don't remember what I call it. I have a number of names for it, but uh, it's a it's a, it's a a card spread that can go up to nine, although I rarely uh, do all nine cards, mm -hmm. but the, I've set it up so that it's modular, right? So you can use it with a three card spread and it works just fine. Uh, you can use it as a five card spread and it works fine. You can use it as a seven card spread and it works fine. Um, and it's sort of, you know, it's sort of designed for my particular style of reading. Like I don't like to do reversals. So I don't do, uh, I don't do the upside down cards. Um, and this spread has, uh, has placements in it that give cards sort of uh, the opportunity to express negative qualities. So you can have, um, you can have the cards still you know, have kind of that the, that reversal effect without uh, having to worry about, you know, what what to do with reversals, um, and that's yeah. I've and I've actually been I haven't thought about it too much lately, but I have talked to some other like really experienced tarot readers about reversals, and they've sort of like given me their approaches to them that have made me kind of be like, oh, maybe I need to rethink this reversal stuff, but. But I haven't rethought it enough to be able to do it right now. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, you know what? Um, In my opinion, the the reversal thing, um, it's not that one should or shouldn't use it, like a, as an absolute, but more like maybe in the way that you read uh, your 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 tarot, you already kind of express that that potential aspect of, of a card even though it, it, it might come up uh, upright i mean perhaps your style of reading you know expresses that that uh that uneasiness or whatever it is that the the, the upside down cards might might express and somebody perhaps who, who is a little bit more pragmatic if it comes up right they will only express the positive side perhaps of the card and only express the negative when it comes upside down. So it's like kind of different, different perspectives of the of the reading. I think. Yeah, yeah. I think. Yeah, I think that's a good way to look at it. Mm. I don't know. I still, yeah. I don't know. I, 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 I wish I could remember some of the other uh, things that people have told me about reversals. Um, I know I've written them down somewhere, but I didn't. Yeah, and, and, and at the same time, our our style of reading evolves with time and with experience. Mm -hmm. So at some point, maybe, oh, you know, now I feel I, I should include the, the reverse cards. And then eventually, maybe, you know what, now I'm only, only going to do the reverse cards. <laughs> <laughs> only reversed cards. <laughs> Yeah, I think one of my one of my big problems with them was when I first started learning tarot, you know, I got um, Arthur Edward Waite's book, The Key to the Tarot, which is sort of like his book about the writer Waite Smith tarot deck. And um, it was like all of the cards had their upright meanings and their reversed meanings uh, included in the book, but the reversed meanings were so often just completely different that I was like, how, 
this is ridiculous. Why do I have to memorize a whole nother 78 card meanings? Mm -hmm. uh, but that's old thinking, you know, I don't really use that system anymore. I have my own way of interpreting the tarot. And yeah. so I guess maybe I just need to, uh, uh, at some point I'm going to need to adapt. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, well, are we ready for the reading? Yeah, awesome, let's do it. Okay, I'm going to turn off my camera for a second because I have to uh, do a little bit of adjustment. Uh, I'll leave my audio on so that if um, all of this this mass of cables ends up pulling things over, you guys can hear how disastrous it gets over here. You can hear the explosion <laughs> and the fire burning. <laughs> oh yeah, exactly. Okay, my video will be back in a minute. Oh, I like your picture. Where are you there? Is that uh, uh, no, that is actually uh, out in central Oregon. Um, near my parents' place. Uh, I think I took that uh, probably last winter, two winters ago when I was out there. It's it's a beautiful spot. Yeah. Okay, hold on. This and has got to work. You told me recent, well, maybe not recently, but this year there, there were like some fires over there. How, how did that work out? Um, that was most of the fires were uh, last year. Last year we had it really, really bad. It was a, it was lots of really disastrous fires uh and it worked out pretty poorly for oregon actually mm -hmm. um yeah a couple of towns got destroyed uh it it was bad there were there was a lot of uh, a lot of houses and stuff got burned um yeah, the air quality and yeah to move. yeah you know fortunately i don't think there were a huge number of deaths there there were some but it wasn't as bad as uh it could have been thankfully mm. but um yeah okay hold on let me I, I just have to finish one more adjustment yeah perfect i'll, I'll, continue. I'll continue talking over the over the <laughs> there so i'm as i was saying just now i'm i'm learning to, to read the tarot and i've i've tried uh I mean, like I'm, I'm right now. I'm doing regularly, maybe not every day, but regularly, like pulling one card for the day and kind of navigating the energy and and, and keeping that that archetype present in my mind throughout the day and and seeing how how it can, on the one hand, maybe predispose me to to face the different things during the day uh, from from another uh, perspective or a kind of. Um, informed sort of perspective, a, a, a mystically informed perspective throughout the day. And and it's it's been really, really wonderful. And like for example, when I'm when I'm here on the computer and I'm doing some work or whatever, I sometimes I keep a card on the side that I wanted to like to to infuse my my personality or my 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 actions and my mind during the time that I'm working. I'll, I'll have like I like uh, the one of swords. I don't know. It gives me this this powerful feeling of 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 starting something, but also of having like that that clarity and and a clear mind throughout a project. And yeah, I've, I've been trying stuff like that. Uh, yeah, I I like that. I I do that too. I have a um. Excuse me. <coughs> I have a uh, a little um oracle deck with uh that's that's about like uh helping your creativity and when i'm having one of those periods i'll like pull one of the little creativity cards out and put it next to my desk to kind of keep me on track or help yeah. me keep on track yeah i love it okay so as you can see i did get things set up like look here in my hands amazing <laughs> uh nothing came crashing down uh no there are there are some uh cables precariously stretched i i but uh, yeah, I think this will work. Look, I have a candle too. I don't know if you can. Yeah, oh, cool one. Old school candle. Old school candle. This is a great setup. So remind us, what was the name of this deck? This is the Sacred Rose Tarot. Um, and I have, I actually do have a uh, little book. Uh, the instructions are by Joanna Sherman. And the artwork is uh, uh, the artwork is also Johanna Sherman. Um, and this deck, the copyright says 1982. Um, so maybe that's when it originally came out. I don't know a whole lot else about it, but uh, 
it's such a cool looking deck. I think this will be this will be fun. <clears throat> and I did make this bag. You did? Oh, wow. Yeah, I like to sew. <laughs> mm, it's very good. Thanks. Yeah. So I switched okay. the camera to, to, to put your thing in, in like full screen. Okay. So you can get uh, those who are watching this on YouTube and get the, the immersive experience. Okay. I'm going to shuffle. I hope this isn't too loud. Yeah. No, no, no. And I'll, I'll be, I'll mute my. For a moment. Yeah, and, and in any case, I'll just jump on. Okay, so here we go. Oh, wait, Rafa, can you remind me of the question one more time? Yeah, sure. Um, so, what can we expect, and how do we best be ready to show up and make the most of 2022? Okay. What we expect, and how. To show up and make the most of 2022. Okay, that's a good question. Sound of the shuffling is so satisfying. Oh, good, good. I never know how my microphone is going to react to it. All right, here we go. Okay, so the way this works is the first card is going to be just sort of like the general situation. So when we're talking about like uh, what to expect in 2022, this would be this, we could probably consider this to be kind of like a card of the year. Like what is the year, the theme of the year going to be? And it's a nice card. It's not even a bad card. Oh, I was kind of worried. I was like, oh man, if we get death, this is gonna be depressing. <laughs> But um, it would be hard to, to explain that to people. I know we would be like, okay, uh, we're just aborting. <laughs> Episode's over. <laughs> yeah, off the ship. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. So here, I can hold it up a little closer. See, there we go. Um, so the Queen of Pentacles. Uh, this is such a this is such a lovely card in this position. Um, Pentacles are the suit of earth and queens are the, the cards of, of water. They're the, uh, the face card of water. So here we have water of earth, which is, which is a good combination, right? I mean, water plus earth uh, does make mud, but you can use mud to build stuff. Um, Pentacles, earth, it, the, the, as the suit of earth, it is all about kind of like the material world. It's about building, it's about uh, homes, it's about health, it's about uh, wealth and money. Um, so it's all kind of the material world stuff. And queens, I usually look at them as kind of like decision makers. So the queen of pentacles is kind of about decision making and foundational stuff like that in the material world. Um, in this card in particular, there are a few things I think that are really nice about it. So you can see, uh, first of all, it's very verdant. There's tons and tons of greenery around, uh, but the queen herself is holding, you know, things of gold. So there's like the gold crown up on top. She has a gold pentacle in one hand and a gold uh, rose in the other hand. Um, and here's, uh, you know, if I if I use this deck exclusively, I would have a really good idea of the symbolism of all the different roses because those the sacred roses show up in various cards. I think there are, um, I think it's just red, white, and gold roses, but there might be some other colors too. And I think that the color symbolism is pretty important in the deck, but I just don't remember what it is because I, you know, I, I switch decks a lot. And um, so I think it's a good start. We're off to a good start with the Queen of Pentacles. Uh, the theme of the year is going to have to do with uh, 
sort of like decision making for the material world or in the material world. Okay, next. This card is the what to avoid card. The Knight of Wands. And we're also going to pull the, the third card, which is the what to pursue card. The Six of Swords. Okay. Uh, here we have, uh, I mean, this is interesting, you know, uh, I guess, you know, knights are definitely associated with swords. So having the two of these kind of opposite each other is, is cool. Um, wands are the suit of fire uh, and knights are air. So as a face card, this is um, about air and fire, which, you know, since this is kind of a negative spot, the what to avoid card, you can see that there's a lot of uh, volatility there. I think that one of the things that the Knight of Wands would be warning us about in this situation in this side is um, rushing to action too hastily. Uh, let me back up a little bit. Wands are the suit, as the suit of fire, they deal kind of with um, passion and drive and sort of like formative energies, right? The, the Wands suit, um, you know, when they when they apply, you know, kind of in 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 lower realms, they apply to things that are kind of like our passions and drives. But in higher realms, they tend to be associated with kind of like the realm of forms and ideas. Um, and knights are action cards. Knights are about like taking swift action and doing things quickly and acting um, acting immediately. But as the Knight of Wands is in the what to avoid spot here. I think it's sort of a warning against, um, it's probably a warning against like jumping to conclusions too quickly, taking actions too quickly without sort of like slowing down and pondering stuff. Um, and, and so that's, I think is a really good warning when we're looking at, you know, a year based on pentacles, which is the slowest of elements. Um, and then over here, the, the, this is a really good opposite to it, the Six of Swords. So swords can be troublesome cards, but sixes are great. Every six card is kind of a card about love. And swords are the suit of air, which is about knowledge and intelligence and um, learning and sometimes like inevitables and processes. But here, since we have it in the What to Pursue column, they went to what to pursue place. I think that this card represents uh, kind of a pursuit of the love of knowledge and learning. So we have this balance here where, you know, when we're talking about like, how do we best pursue the queen of pentacles for the year, it's not going to be through the rash action and decision-making of the knight of wands, but through kind of the acknowledgement, oh, excuse me, I have to, <clears throat> It's going to be through sort of the love and acknowledgement of knowledge that the Six of Swords represents. Yeah, that's pretty clear. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so now... Oh, you got, oh, cool, you guys can see it when I'm drinking my tea. <laughs> okay, so now uh, let's move on to the next two cards. Uh, this first card is going to be about obstacles. This is this is the uh, the fourth card. The fourth card is about obstacles. The four of pentacles. All right, that's interesting. And then the fifth card is about tools, strength. Okay, I see. Uh, okay, there are some challenges here. You know, the four of pentacles and the strength card. There's a lot about these two cards that are similar. Um, and kind of foundational. I'm thinking of, uh, well, okay, let me just get into this. Uh, so once again, in the Four of Pentacles, we do have, you can see the golden rose again. That, so that rose is shown up there. And that's probably important. Um, fours are cards about sitting still. Uh, the Four of Pentacles, you know, as the earthly card, as the card of earth is kind of a card about like, hoarding resources, saving, um, being stingy, uh, you know, sitting on, sitting on wealth and not allowing it to move, um, not being willing to make change. Uh, so I think as an obstacle card, it's a warning that, um, you know, even though we do have the thing down here urging us to not be hasty, the obstacle will be 
that it is very easy to sit still. Um, so I think that's important. It's kind of making me, it honestly is making me think uh, of, you know, sort of like the climate change problems that like the entire planet is facing right now and how it's difficult for us to make changes. Like we know it has to happen. Nobody really seems to want to make the first move, uh, especially amongst like the big economic players. Uh, so it's easy for us to sit still. <laughs> it's very easy for no change to happen, which is just gonna lead to disaster, but whatever. I guess maybe, maybe that'll be it. <laughs> Um, so then over here in the tools uh, place, we have the strength card. Um, this is such a cool, like, you know, we were talking about sort of like the 70s artwork in this. And I feel like this lion in this card just totally embodies that so well. Like, look at that cool face. Um, I don't see, there's no rose in this card, but there is something interesting that shows up in a lot of face cards that I'll talk about here in a second, or in a lot of the, the, the Trumps, the major cards. Um, strength is a card of uh, fortitude and endurance. Um, it's a card that reflects uh, a lot of, I mean, it's, it's a very idealistic card, but as a card in the uh, tools column, I think what it's reminding us of is that we do have strength. We have access to a great amount of strength. Um, you know, humankind for all of the faults it has uh, also has enormous potential and enormous capabilities. And I think, think the strength card is in this position in the tools spot is a reminder that when we want to show up in 2022 and we wanna be ready for things, we have to remember that the individual has a lot of strength. You know, you are, you are rarely powerless. You have a voice, you have a way to express yourself. Sometimes you have a way to um, make a difference and make a change, even if it's with others, uh, but even in your own life, like if you're on your own, remember to look for where your strength is. Oh, yeah. And the thing that I wanted to talk about in this deck, like you can see down here, there's sort of like, it almost looks like the lion is kind of like pulling back the curtain of reality and there's all the stars underneath. So, yeah. Uh, a, a lot of the major arcana in this deck, maybe, maybe all of them have that kind of thing down at the bottom where like reality is getting pulled away and you can see sort of the stars behind the, mm -hmm. the curtain, which is cool. All right, so just to go over what we've seen so far, like we have this idea of um, this year is going to be one where we're going to be facing some decisions uh, with the Queen of Pentacles that have to do with kind of like building and growth, um, things in the material world. You know, that's what we're going to be looking at. We we need to avoid uh, sitting still at, at uh, so we, the, the two cards over here, which are both things that are either gonna be getting in our way or that we need to avoid. Um, one of them is like hasty action, hasty decision, hasty swift motion uh, might not be our best move, um, but we can't let that be an excuse for us to sit still. Instead, we need to gather knowledge. We need to collect knowledge and we need to remember that we do have strength to make decisions and movement when it's necessary. Okay, I'm gonna do two more cards. You ready for this? Yeah. Okay. Uh, first, this card is the past. So this will be the 2021 card. Mm. So far, it's a pretty, a pretty oh, amazing. Oh. Wow. The Hermit. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Uh, I was just reading an, an article that uh, sometime in the past couple of days that was saying that like 54% of the planet, 54% of the people on the planet have experienced some kind of like um, uh, lockdown or, or, or stay at home or, or sheltering thing due to the pandemic. Um, so I think the hermit being a past card is, is kind of on the nose. It's a little sort of like, oh yeah, I remember that time you had to stay home. <laughs> forever <laughs> no it's just um, days don't worry 
<laughs> uh, but I think that there's more going on in that card too. You know, the hermit is a card of like introspection and uh, and uh, seeking wisdom on your own. But there is a lot of solitude in the hermit card, and having it as a past card, I think, is a little reassuring that maybe we won't have to face that kind of thing as much in the coming year. Um, but again, we have uh, we have sort of our potential card here at the end. Uh, I don't really like to look at tarot as being able to predict, predict the future. So this is my only sort of like cheater card where I kind of do that a little bit. So here we go. Potential. The page of swords. Um, I'll move my tea out of the way so we can see that a little better. This is a, uh, this is not a bad card, actually. It's kind of a nice place to end. Mm -hmm. uh, so so the potential card is sort of like if we do things correctly, if we follow our path and we are doing what we want, like we can we can expect to come to this potential card. Um, if it's a good one, if it's a bad card, then we're sort of like, oh, if you go and do the bad things and that's what's gonna happen. But I like the page of swords uh, and let me explain why. Uh, swords, you know, as I said before, they are the suit of air and they deal with kind of, uh, knowledge and ideas and sometimes kind of like inevitables and processes and things of that nature. Um, and the page cards are the swords of earth. So when I look at the face cards in any suit, actually, when I look at the face cards altogether, I kind of envision them as sort of like this story where things, um, things are kind of like at their most abstract and strange up with the with the king of wands and that they're at their most physical and manifested like down at the page of uh, pentacles but the page of swords on the other hand is sort of this place where you know when earth meets or when air meets earth you have a place where uh, ideas can become real things where concepts can take root and start to sprout into reality. Uh, and I think that the symbolism of this card really, really shows that. You can see uh, the page looks uh, fairly peaceful and contemplative and maybe a little pasty like a vampire, but who knows. Uh, but it's, it's sort of like, you know, <laughs> He planted his, his sword in the ground, right? Yeah, exactly. That's what I was going to say. He's planted his sword in the ground and you can see all of the plants in the ground are like springing up around him, right? So it's showing, you know, his sword, which is the symbol of his ideas and his intellect or being, you know, taking root and turning into something new. What an amazing card. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. Yeah. So overall, I would say that this is a fairly uh, positive reading. I think mm -hmm. that um, there's nothing really scary here, uh, except that we have to find a way to balance between these two cards over here. You know, we have to find a way to balance between, um, between, I guess, sort of like brashness or brash action mm -hmm. and uh, and inaction, which, oh, which totally makes me think of something else. Um, the strength card is, uh, is a card of uh, fortitude, right? Which is one of the classical virtues that Plato talks about. Um, and uh, strength or fortitude is frequently described as um, the point between uh, brashness and cowardice. And so I could see that the strength card could actually represent the place between these two cards, where the four of pentacles would be where we are like immobilized by cowardice. And the knight of wands is where we uh, act without thinking and very brashly. So, um, so I think that this really, it, it, it resonates with me as being a, a thing between those two cards. Yeah, and it makes me think of the, um, in the, What's the name in, in the Wizard of Oz? You know, the lion, he's looking for a heart. Is that what he's looking for? For courage. Oh, yeah, 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 true. Looking for courage. It makes me wonder if the, wiz if the Wizard of the Oz guy, wiz Wizard of Oz, uh, Frank Baum, I think his name was, if he, if he knew tarot. Yeah, and if you, if you think about the, here in the, in the Raider Wade, and let me mm -hmm. see, uh, I cleared my camera here also, if it's not... People can see this. 
Um, you were speaking about that kind of balance between rashness and inaction. And so mm -hmm. you're holding open the, the, the mouth of a lion. That's a, a, good, uh, a good place to be in, right? Not to rush him, but at the same time, not to let your, your uh, not to sleep in, on the laurels, like they say. Yeah, yes, I can totally see that. Mm. Okay, hold on. I'm taking a picture of this reading because I like it. <clears throat> okay. Well, do you have any do you have any questions about this reading so far? About this reading? I mean, it's pretty clear. I'm, I'm thinking about the, the challenges uh, in connection in part to, to, to those two cards you're mentioning, that balance between them. And, and I like mm -hmm. this this balance between them that you that you point out in in the in the strength card um i'm also thinking about about fear you know um do you think fear is being addressed at all in this in this reading hmm i i mean i guess at my I guess my instinct is that fear is what would drive us to either of these, right? Both of these would be a fear reaction. You know, acting without thinking is a fear reaction and inaction is a fear reaction. Mm. Uh, so again, I think that that speaks to the strength card and it's sort of like connection to maybe, maybe like, um, you know, there's a, there's an element of courage in the strength card, like you were saying. Yeah. Yeah, and you know what? Also, the the strength card is one of the few ones which has that infinity symbol, and at the same time, in this deck, like you pointed out, it's it's like uncovering the the invisible world or the the world of the subconscious or of the stars or whatever. And I yeah, maybe if that is is um, the position for that one, you said it's tools. So maybe. Um, again, uh, part of the tools that we are being invited to, to look into for next year can, can be like we already are doing with this reading, but to, to, to count on this, on this um, extra non-material side of reality, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that makes me realize something else. So we only got two major arcana, right? We got the strength card over here and hermit over here. And in the hermit card, which is in the past position, we also have this thing where the hermit and his lamp, hold on, am I showing this? The hermit and his lamp are stepping off into that starry field. Mm -hmm. So it's almost sort of, I see sort of a connection there where like, yes, a lot of us were home alone or isolated or, you know, in a hermit-like state, um, which gave everybody a lot of time to kind of like explore themselves, explore parts of themselves that maybe they didn't have to think about very often. And it's probably, so I think that the connection there, like from, from what you were just saying is, uh, you know, we're going to be, you know, the strength card, the tools of the strength card are going to be related to what we learned during our hermit time. Mm, that's amazing. And I, I agree with that. I remember when, when all of this started already two years ago, the other day somebody said the, how many days it's been since it started. I think it was like March or May, May of yeah. 2020. So it's been a year and a half. Yeah, it was March, I think. Or March. Yeah, yeah. Because I remember when it's still, at least that's when it started here. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's a, that's a long time. And I, I'm thinking... That during that time, March 13 or 14th, I think it was. Here I am. I have my week. Oh yeah, yeah. I think you're right because it was like, it was like the second weekend. I remember yeah. when everything locked down, when everything was sort of when the when the when the panic was probably the greatest. That's yeah. yeah. The the toilet paper days. The toilet paper days. <laughs> and during that time. I, I kind of had this sort of uh, being a, an Aquarius sun. I, I already could, could see like forward and I was thinking, wow, this is going to give people a great opportunity to look within, you know, and even before the, um, the, the current situation of 2020, 2021 started, I was seeing, when I started the podcast, I was seeing, and I called it Mystic Times because I was seeing an awakening. I was seeing people becoming more, interested in Tao in, a, in um, 
astrology, in the mystic arts, etc., the esoteric. And this, at the start, this seemed kind of like a thing that had stumped that evolution that had started or that I had seen, uh, I, I thought was starting. So I was mm -hmm. like, oh my God, they, they uh, uh, blocked us. They stopped us from our evolution. Uh, but now with this, with all this reading that we're seeing, it's like, it wasn't necessarily that we were stopped. It was that we required a moment to go within and this seems to be the only way that we were going to do it. And, and I'm pretty sure many people, like I said before, are, are awakening during this period. And many others who awakened several decades before, or who started awakening several decades before, were able to go a lot, a lot deeper than, than it would have been possible in, in yeah, a, a, a year and a half or almost two years now. Oh, yeah. I think that's a really good way to look at it. I think that it really did sort of represent a uh, an opportunity for all of us to kind of like stop and pause and take a break and reevaluate some things. I, I feel like I've seen that a lot, you know, just sort of anecdotally, I've seen it in a lot of the people around me, like, you know, friends and family and stuff who were, who were you know, forced to really kind of like take a step back, you know. Yeah, uh, retreat. Yeah. Um, well, I'm going to move, unless you want to keep looking at these, I will move my camera back. Does that no, sound good? Get yourself yeah? back. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> and also I'm thinking now when you're coming back, um, when all of this started, I did a reading with, with, um, Bonomo, um, I'm, I'm blanking on his, on his name, Robert Bonomo. <laughs> Um, oh yeah i know him yeah and it was a, a pretty cool reading which had this this kind of undertone or, or whatever we can call it of of finances and of uh of money or like like we, we wanted to know more about the 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 energy behind it was starting back then and it gave us the the cards gave us this thing of like there are some um financial interests behind all this so at that time it kind of demystified it a little bit and was like oh wow so if this situation was caused by by people with a kind of a a more perhaps um, selfish plan or whatever behind the their actions it seems they they are looking to gain some money from this or to make um, some financial gains from the, the the situation that's coming up and that that was a pretty interesting thing and and i don't know i'm i'm like thinking of that reading in the context of what we're reading right now also mm -hmm. yeah i mean i think that that is always going to be the case you know there are always people trying to make a profit off of uh disasters you know that's just that's just the that's just what we've created for ourselves you know mm. it, it, which is i think an unfortunate thing about humanity but it's also part of what happens when we just like don't take care of each other you know i think part of that might be caused you know i think part of that is caused by greed for sure which is a which is a pretty vicious monster but i think another part of it is caused by uh fear you know fear fear uh drives us to do things like war profiteering and you know pandemic profiteering and that sort of thing so yeah i can see that yeah um yeah for me um, when, when we did that reading it gave me a, a kind of a kind of reassurance of of the way that i was seeing the situation in that it it doesn't seem, and, and looking back today, it doesn't seem this was like a, it was, I mean, I, I don't mean to, to disrespect anybody or disrespect anybody's suffering or whatever anybody might have gone through during this period. I, I'm sending all my love to everybody, but it doesn't seem to be what we 
would imagine a pandemic or a plague. You know, there, there's been times, at least in recorded history, whether they're true or not, that the, the bubonic plague, for example, or, or the Spanish flu that's been mentioned during this period as well, it apparently killed millions and millions of people. And, and this, this thing doesn't seem to have been the, the whole, uh, what do you call it when, when they, it, it was hyped so much? I mean, didn't leave a yeah. expectation of the hype. Well, I mean, thank God, right? Yeah. Like we, there, I, none of us wanted it to. Nobody wanted it to live up to the hype. Like that would have been awful. Like, I mean, but at the same time, maybe the hype is what helped keep us safe. Maybe the hype is what helped keep it from turning into that. Mm. You know, we, that's something that we can't really know. We would never, we'll never know what would happen if we ignored it. Mm. You know, um, it's a, that's definitely like one of the uh, always a question of what if with something like that, but uh, you know, you know, I mean, it, it's it's funny because we know here in Oregon where so one of the things that's been happening and happening in Oregon is uh, like the climate change has been hitting us here. Mm. You know, we broke we broke heat waves this summer that were just awful. I wish I remembered what the Celsius numbers were, but uh, in Portland, we hit uh, like 116 degrees Fahrenheit, which is just brutally hotter than mm -hmm. anything ever. Like, yeah, I don't know. Uh, but, but, you know, we've also been having the forest fires. We've been having, uh, we've been having like extreme droughts. Uh, we had a, we had another heat wave at the end of November where we broke heat records for like three or four days straight, which is, it's just ridiculous right now. You know I mean? I have no idea what it's going to be like here. I don't know how, uh, how long it'll stay livable. Um, mm. So, you know, sometimes we can see what happens when we don't take action. Yeah. Um, but when we do take action and we manage to stop something bad from happening, or we have, we manage to stop something from getting worse. It's, it's, it's sometimes easy to mm. think to ourselves, well, maybe the problem wasn't that bad, mm. but we can't always really know. Mm. You know, I think that's kind of important to keep in mind. And like, maybe in, uh, to respect your time and kind of for, for closing, this was a, an amazing reading. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm happy that, that we got the opportunity to, to look into this, uh, this starry, starry as part of the, of the world. Um, yeah, me too. And I'm thinking now that you bring up the, the idea of inaction and action, like what could we say could be potentials potential situations next year that that would um, that might ask for us to to keep that strength and that balance between doing you know, acting rashly and and staying too still what what things could be like looming over the horizon you know on a global scale that's a difficult thing to uh, that's a difficult thing to know um, I guess, you know, one thing that I would think about a lot is uh, the Six of Swords and the What to Pursue column, which is uh, kind of about pursuing knowledge and the love of knowledge. Uh, I think... Knowledge in, in the sense of like facts, perhaps? Yeah, facts might be a really good way to look at it. Like seek out, oops, excuse me, seek out facts, seek out information, look for... I guess maybe look now for the kind of information that you think could help you in the future. You know, it's time, it's time to prepare uh, your mind through uh, education and uh, maybe, maybe try broadening the sources of information that you are looking at. Maybe try, you know, learning stuff about, uh, you know, I mean, since we're sort of looking at a reading for like all of humanity, try learning new things about, uh, a neighboring country or a neighboring uh, culture that you don't know anything about, mm. you know, but maybe that would be a good way to do it. Um, try to get new aspects on how information comes to you or new perspectives on how information is coming to you. You know, mm -hmm. so like if you're an American, uh, subscribe to some uh, Mexican news sources, you know, I th actually, that would be amazing for Americans. I wish Amer I wish people in the United States would do that. <laughs> um, so maybe that would be a way to do it. Like try to try to expand your perspectives a little bit, uh, see what other people are learning or how other people are uh, being told to uh, look at the world. 
Mm, that's a very good. Why? Why did you? What? How did you come to the idea of like connect to a, 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 another culture and how they are seeing things? Well, I, I sort of started abstracting. Like one of the problems that the United States is facing right now is we have this like really deep political divide, mm -hmm. uh, and the uh, people seem to think that the political divide is caused by like the types of information or where people get their information, right? So people who uh, lean to the right uh, only get their news from like specific places like Fox News or something. And people who, who lean to the left only get their news from very specific places. So there's kind of like a movement to try to create, you know, news sources that show, you know, political opinions from both sides or news sources from both sides and what people are saying. Um, and I was thinking about that and I was kind of like, well, that's something that's really specific to the United States, but if we were going to generalize it, um, you know, I was thinking of like kind of what I know about Latin America, which admittedly is not as much as I should. But, you know, when I was living in uh, Costa Rica, one of the things that um, that I discovered was that uh, people south of Mexico uh, had a lot of negative feelings towards Mexico. And I was like, but why? You know, I was so I was I, I mean, I never really got a good answer, but it did make me think about how like uh, we all tend to be so wrapped up in our own local views of things that sometimes we forget that people outside of our area have incredibly different ways of looking at things. And a lot of times that's based on what they're told. You know, we all tend to, I mean, this is just a human trend, right? Like we want to, we, it's way easier when somebody tells you what to think. When, and so, so we all kind of do that by default. It's sort of our default mode. And uh, so learning what the learning what people in another country are being told to think might help you get more perspective on the way you think. Yeah, that's really beautiful. I think the United States has a very important role still to play in, in the world. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. there's some like kind of shifts in in world powers, who is going to be the world power for, for the next whatever many years. Um, there's uh, some kind of a shift going on there. There's stuff going on in the background that we maybe never find about. Uh, but I think one of the things that, that has led the US to be perhaps uh, on, on, on the decline uh, this, this time, I think it's got to do with that, with a kind of self-centeredness. You know, it's such a huge country with so much culture and so much Mm, great people and knowledge and, and such growth and it's got its own like tempo and it goes to, to the rhythm of its own drum and it has had I think the, the detriment of forgetting that that they were carrying the you know the this race in the Olympics where they pass the I don't know oh, what yeah, it, the torch the, the torch or the, they pass the baton from one to the to the next and then continue the race um, I think it's 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 been on the on the front for so long that it's kind of forgotten. Uh, you know that again the the wolves. You've seen that that video of like the old ones actually go in the back and the and the not the old ones, sorry, but the, the alphas go actually in the back and they are taking care of everybody. Mm -hmm. The weaker ones or younger ones are going in the front or in the center, and and it seems like. The U.S. has a, a kind of period of learning now to to be the positive influence that it can be in the in the next uh, many years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, I think that's true. I think that um, like the, the role think, has changed. I think for the U.S. I think too. Yeah, I think that the U.S. has lost influence and maybe hasn't uh, really accepted that yet. And by the U.S., I actually mean the people there. You yeah. and everybody, right? Not this kind of egregore thing that that is uh, kind of out of control right now. But uh, from from its cells, you know, which are the, the people themselves, it, mm -hmm. its personality can change and, and start becoming the the kind of positive leader that that humanity needs right now. I think. I hope we can do that. I hope we can pull it off. <laughs> yeah, I really think so. I've had conversations with so many people from over there. Uh, in mm -hmm. the podcast and I'm I have this okay given it's it's people that I already uh, I'm aware of from before and that I respect even but uh, from the types of conversations I see some minds and some hearts that are like 
I, I, they give me lots of great hope for not just for the US, but for all of humanity to, to have those types of people placed geographically in, in that area. I think it's going to be a, a, an amazing time coming, coming up. Yeah, I, I hope so. I hope yeah. so too. <laughs> yeah, that includes you too. <laughs> I'll work on it. I will work on it. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, you're already being a, a great example, you know, with your joy that you exude and and the, the the positive energy that you share. For me, that's one of the greatest values of, of any person here. So I thank you so much for your time, for the openness uh, in, in coming the first time and in coming back. And we've been kind of uh, chatting back and forth in, via Instagram and getting to know each other a little bit more. So I thank you so much for, for coming up. Yeah, thank you, Rafa. This is a pleasure. Yeah, well, it's my pleasure too. Please uh, share with people the, the links to your stuff, your, your podcast. It's, it's coming, it's coming some, it's getting like some, some interesting conversations coming up. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, my, my uh, website where my podcast and all my stuff can be found is uh, arnemancy.com, A R N E M A N C Y. Um, and yeah, I'm actually, uh, next year, I'm going to be, during the first part of the year, I'm going to be doing a, uh, a series of podcast episodes on um, Heinrich Cornelius Agrippa's Three Books of Occult Philosophy. It's going to be sort of a deep dive into some of his ideas and concepts, sort of looking maybe at where they came from, but also, you know, where they've gone and how they've sort of remained in the, you know, kind of esoteric world and what, what that's all about. So uh I'm kind of putting together the plan. It's a, it's a it's a new type of project for me, so it's mm -hmm. it feels a little ambitious, but it seems to be coming together pretty well. Great, amazing. Um, well, yeah. I'm sending you lots of love, lots of great energies for that project. Anything that you need that I could help with, you just just give me a call. And um, all right, thank you. I'm, I'm thanking also everybody that's been with us for this reading. Uh, I appreciate you guys showing up. Um, please keep in mind that uh, you can contact me if you want you know, to, to, to chat or to maybe see about uh, I'm doing Akashic Records readings. You can contact me on Instagram. And um, what else? Uh, also, I have a Patreon, which you can check out and get access to extra content. I'm posting uh, the second hour of, of many of the shows. And I'm also posting some music and soundbats that I've been uh, creating. To, to share with, with everybody that's supporting the show. So um, I also appreciate so much the likes, the shares, the subscription, whatever. Uh, that is also a great support. And um, well, I'm very happy to have the opportunity to, to share this with everybody. And thank you again, Eric. Thank you, everybody. See you next time. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. <laughs>